Hi, this is Steffi and welcome to The Financial Fox. Today on this show, we talk about a big problem, which is the banking for crypto and digital assets firm and any business in Web3. But it's not just business, it's also individuals, it's also investors. They are struggling to get a bank account. They are struggling to on and off ramp their digital assets. And this is a big problem that must be solved. And we see banking being a bit resistant and uh, the government, the regulators, maybe they should uh, engage more with the industry. They should get more educated. To discuss this problem, I've invited on the show today Claire Cummins. She's a British leading solicitor specializing in crypto law and in the current and evolving regulations for digital assets. Any question that you have, any input that you want to give, and uh, I would say anybody that want to get involved in spreading the message out, telling what the problem are, please engage with us on social media. This is a real big issue that must be addressed. And if you need a solution, you should find out more about our sponsor, Green Gage. Green Gage provides e-money accounts for small and medium-sized enterprises, high net worth investors and digital assets firms. They leverage the latest technologies, including blockchain, to unlock new funding and liquidity, a game-changing for many SMEs, which are fundamentally underserved by traditional financial services. As a client of Green Gage, you will have a dedicated relationship manager, yes, a real person who will listen. And getting started with Green Engage is easy, trust me. I've gone through the process myself and it's been really simple and quick. So, if you are seeking a more personalized experience in managing your accounts in the digital space, I genuinely encourage you to check out Green Gage. And here is a little bonus for you, my wonderful listeners. Use the code FOX10 when signing up to enjoy a 10% on the first year's fee on corporate accounts only. The link is in the description, so take a moment to explore what Green Gage has to offer. Now, back to the show. And before we get into the interview, if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, click the subscribe button now and follow us on social media to stay up to date with our news and interviews. Hi, Claire. How are you? Uh, hi, Steffi. Very well. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're here talking um, about one of uh, the major problems, I will say, for companies in Web3, companies that are embracing blockchain and crypto, they can't get banking. No, they can't. And I think it's wider than that, actually. I think when we're going to do, if we're going to discuss the inability to get a bank account, I think we have to think and talk about the impact that has on individuals and businesses, because the two are very combined. You know, people build businesses. Businesses employ people. Um, and if you're happy with it, I'd also like to touch on why I think that a bank account is essential for all of us to play our part in democracy. I think that's all great. Let's start with a short introduction of yourself, what you do, and why you are so much focused on On this this aspect. Exactly. Well, I am the managing partner of a firm called Cummings Pepperdine, and we're solicitors, and we advise an awful lot on the law and regulation for what I would broadly call digital asset firms. And so I'm using that term as an all-encompassing phrase for crypto assets, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, anything digital as a whole. And of course, that includes the sort of the growth of Web3, which I think is going to be an extraordinary event and really allow us to control our own data and our own insight, our own access to and use of the internet. So I think it's right as it's been called recently, to, to describe Web3 as the democratisation of the internet. Um, I'm also the, uh, the founder of a, a think tank dealing in digital assets and democracy, and it's called the Centre for Digital Assets and Democracy, or CDAD for short. And one of the issues that I'm very focused on in my work as a solicitor for clients, and also my work 
for within CDAD is why it is so difficult for anybody to get a bank account if they explain to the bank that they're involved in some way, even tangentially sometimes, in crypto assets or digital assets is my all-encompassing encompassing phrase. Now, when I say tangentially, what I have found in the past is that where I have clients who are involved in IT services for digital assets, they also have found it impossible to get bank accounts. And it strikes me that this is very wrong. And it also strikes me when I look at the rules uh, on anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing, that there is not actually any basis amongst regulations that would allow banks to do this. It seems to me that it's an internal policy to do with risk and therefore it is up to the banks to look more closely at what businesses are doing. It is up to the banks to look at what individuals are doing and it's up to the banks to put in place enhanced or better um, customer due diligence including enhanced due diligence and look at what businesses are doing and with an educated mind consider what the risks are and I say with an educated mind because I don't think that it's really yet in sort of mainstream understanding that digital assets are built on blockchain and blockchain allows what's been called before if I could um, quote somebody else the disinfectant of transparency it is transparent and it's immutable. So if you want to know where something has gone, follow the blockchain. And I think that needs to be understood better by banks. Claire, can I stop you here? Let's take a step back and let's talk about definitions because you mentioned digital assets, you also mentioned crypto, and uh, that's, and then we mentioned risks, obviously. So you think, um, Maybe the problem is really about definition of what crypto is, what crypto assets is, what digital assets are. And that's because there is kind of confusion around those aspects or those nuances of the crypto industry. Is that the reason why there is no proactive um, uh, or there is no embracing of uh, this industry from the banking system? I don't know that is the reason actually because I we do actually have, we do now have dig, uh, we do have definitions for crypto assets we have a definition that comes from the fifth money laundering directive which is European wide and it was European wide pre brexit so the UK also has a fifth money laundering directive in fact that you know that is the application you make to the SCA to be registered for crypto asset services you use that that regulation. Uh, Mika, the the EU regulation on um, crypto assets, that also has a definition of crypto assets. And then in the UK, we had in June royal assent given to a Financial Services and Markets Act 2023, which again contains a different definition of crypto assets. Now, certainly the definitions aren't exactly the same. Certainly some are slightly broader than others. But I would say that there is enough similarity to really know whether you are in or out. I would say that in this country we have a, we, we have a principles-based system of regulation. So you can take your regulate, you can take principles in the spirit to determine what a crypto asset is as well as the definition that's been provided. And I'd also make the point that I'm talking about English banks, so banks in the United Kingdom. So these are banks that should be fully aware of the definition of a crypto asset. So banks in the United Kingdom should be aware of that definition, should be able to apply that definition to business, and should, with that factual information, be able to make a proper and fact-based decision on risks. Okay, so the problem is still there, though, because uh, you know, it's not just um, just a question. I mean, I, I would say that generally getting a bank account is not so easy, even if you are not. <laughs> so I think, you know, you talk to any accountant, you will say, oh, you have a bank account. Okay, even if you don't use it, keep it there. Don't, <laughs> yeah, you know, just keep it. So 
having a bank account is still a problem. So maybe that is also something that we should take in consideration. And then when it comes down to, okay, I'm doing a Web3 or a tangent related project that has got something to do with blockchain and crypto assets, then it's going to get less difficult. If we have to break down what is difficult from a banking perspective, what they are uh, concerned, is that the due diligence on uh, the people, is that where the funds come from, is that where the money the company is making is coming from, is the involvement of tokens, and then we get even more complicated with that. But yeah, yeah I think it will be helpful maybe to kind of point uh, what are, uh, exactly. I confess, I'm not entirely certain because as I say, I don't think there is any reason in the rules why crypto should should just be sort of thrown out like a baby with the bathwater. So my suspicion on this is twofold. One is that I think that the banks just don't really get what crypto is. And part of that might be because crypto does actually threaten the stranglehold. Actually, that's quite a strong word, but I think it probably is. Yeah, it is worth using because you have to have a bank account to be able to function. Yeah. Crypto can disintermediate banks, so it threatens a stranglehold. So maybe there's something within the, the mindset of bankers that says they don't want to be involved in this, that they think that the risk that their clients have is going to somehow be passed on to them, that they will somehow be involved in money laundering, which I, if I could note, it's called money laundering, not crypto laundering, by the way, that any nefarious actions which are carried out through crypto will then rebound on them. The question then comes, well, how do we tackle this? Well, you know, there are various ways of doing this. I mean, one would be to take an entirely legalistic and potentially litigious approach to this with the banks. I think the best way is actually through education. I think that the best thing to do is for banks to open up and their compliance and risk and legal departments to engage with the crypto industry and actually find out where the risks are, more importantly, where the risks aren't. Now, I appreciate I sound like some politician going on the Today programme. Everybody's always talking about discussion and engagement. You, you know what? Yeah, oh, yeah, we'll, you know, everything will be fine if we can discuss and engage. I don't mean it in any sort of placatory or non act non-active sense. I really do mean that there should be what I would sort of, it's perhaps incendiary to say this, what I call direct action. The banks must come together with the crypto industry and listen to what we do, listen to what we say. They must come together with, to, with people who are in blockchain who can explain you know, what, what blockchain does and the benefits it brings. Now I'm not saying that crypto is totally without its bad players and I'm not saying that in the past it hasn't been used for some quite wicked activities nor am I saying that at the moment it isn't used for wicked activities. When I've worked with people on, on trying to track down stolen assets it's been quite obvious that the people who steal these assets then send you know the various crypto and remember this is they also send money it's not just crypto onto the North Korean nuclear missile program. It goes into the personal wallets of generals in the, the, well, what used to be the, called the KGB, those who are you know, the, the, inv the invaders of Ukraine, a sovereign state. So it is used for bad things as well, but I would make the point that so is money. You know, it's not just crypto. And I would also just add to that, that I was talking to the Bitcoin Policy Institute in the US last week, and they had been they'd had a, a meeting with the FBI and somebody from the FBI said to them, we love it when people steal Bitcoin. I appreciate this is just one type of asset. We love it when people steal Bitcoin because we can go on chain, we can go onto the blockchain and we can see where it is. It doesn't always mean you can get it back, but at least they can see where it is and try and follow who's got it. That's very difficult to do when you have money disappearing into criminal criminal activity or terrorist activity, pure cash. Yeah, exactly. I think that's uh, that's a point. And as you said, it's not just about crypto. It's been done with cash forever. Yeah, it's called um, money laundering. Not yeah, laundering. exactly. Now, <clears throat> what are your thoughts on crypto exchanges becoming more like banks? Because, you know, you have got an account in a crypto exchange, uh, you get paid there, you can kind of change, move the money as you want. So in a way, 
some crypto exchanges are becoming kind of like yeah i think you're you're absolutely right on that and i think also if you are a crypto business a bank account is preferable but there are other ways that you can sort of hold money particularly maybe if you are an exchange and there's some margining you know you can invest in money market funds you can your treasury itself can invest directly in for example t bills settling t plus one or japanese uh, um, bonds, which are probably sort of a T plus T plus three settlement. So you've got different liquidity there to hedge against what you've got. But certainly, yes, I uh, I could go onto a regulated or sort of say registered exchange with with um with either Cummings Pepperdine or the Centre for Digital Assets and Democracy, open a wallet within that regulated exchange. I can custody my wallet with a re- with a registered wallet provider or I could self custody and put in place backups in case I manage to lose my key. And I can I can put fiat in there, keep it as fiat, I can kind of use it in bank it and I can take it out and I and I can pay. But quite often when you want to take money off ramp and you know, pay for example if I want to pay wages, yeah. I'm not gonna be able to you know, I've got to get that money into a bank account. And that's where we get Sort of the mismatch in the system a system which isn't entirely fluid yeah i think i think wages you can maybe still get by paying them in crypto if you really want and, and your employee yeah. are okay but definitely when if, you go and buy if it's, if it's accepted, your, yeah if it's accepted but remember i'd be very wary about paying wages in crypto to say for example my secretary who is to my mind probably the brightest person in our firm it should be her that's the lawyer and me that's the secretary <laughs> But, and I'm not joking about that, a number of people have said that to, to her in the past, that she should be the lawyer. But I am very, I'd be very wary of paying her in something as volatile as and Bitcoin, yeah, or something as different to Bitcoin as Ether and still volatile, because she is in effect a retail customer. And I don't think that it's fair on her to place that sort of, that, that, the volatility risk on a retail customer. Yeah, and then uh, obviously when you go and you have really to buy goods is not well, some places are actually accepting crypto mm. right now but is that kind of like um, uh, and also is the exchange rate that could be quite high as well yeah so it's not really as smooth so I, it looks to me there is this uh, like infrastructure missing piece which is the on and off ramp and uh, it doesn't seem also the many companies or many fintech companies are actually focusing on this missing piece and that one of the reasons why I like uh, for example companies like Green Gage that you know as well they yeah, are trying to create yeah. that you know to create solution for this on and off run which today is a real problem for web3 and a digital assets company but i would say general also for high net worth investors yeah. um, for high net worth individual for investors for also you know many people they need the missing piece that now is not so widely accessible or widely yes. Yeah, and a shout out to Green Gauge, and also a shout out to some of the other firms that are doing that as um, doing that as well. There is a reason, though, that I have hope here, and it's not just the work being done by Green Gauge and other players in the same space. It's that when I look back to my when I look back to when I started acting as a lawyer for hedge funds twenty years ago, hedge funds also found it very difficult to get bank accounts. The moment they said hedge or derivative, the banks would just sort of flee in terror. And this was despite the fact that these fund managers themselves were regulated by the FCA. So, you, you know, they were, they were probably doing a better job of anti-money laundering than many of the banks were, frankly. But it became understood and it became, and the hedge funds were then able to get bank accounts in the UK. But I think one of the motivators for the banks coming round to their their realisation of the risks and their informed and educated understanding of risks, which therefore led to an informed and educated application of their own rules, is that there was a lot of money to be made out of them. And I, I am hopeful that the push of us within the industry, the, the, the realisation within the banks that actually this is, this is a whole new scene of business that that they can undertake will will move banks into accepting bank accounts 
for digital asset firms and those who are even tangential to, biz- to digital assets. But I would say that those of us in the industry, you know, we, we can't just stop and do nothing. And, you know, we've all got to play our part. And I would say that's partly one of the reasons. And, and that is actually one of the things that the Centre for Digital Assets and Democracy is focusing on. Um, and not just the business, but also the importance of having a bank account to take part in day to day life. And you should be able to open a bank account regardless of your political views. So we have seen, for example, not just Nigel Farage debanked, but also the alternative end of the political spectrum, Gina Miller has been debanked. Are they peps? Yes. Do banks use the rules for enhanced due diligence so that they can take on peps, so that people aren't denied um, access to banking? No, I don't think they do really. And yet the FCA has explicitly said, this is, this is not rec- this isn't the, re- the result of their, their recent investigation, by the way, but they have in the past explicitly said that you cannot deny somebody a bank account just because they're, pet. That's, they're a pet. That's not a good reason. Can't happen. Yeah, I think this is a very important point because access to money is really a human right and it shouldn't be limited and sh- it shouldn't be prohibited as well so um, yes and I think you know it's more than that because when you have businesses that are creating jobs creating employment you know how do they work if they can't if they can't open bank accounts if they can't pay their service providers if they yeah. can't pay their they pay their employees and then how do those individuals work if then how do those individuals pay their bills or take part in a normal society and build communities without the ability to actually keep money safely in a, in a bank. I, I do think there is a, a wider duty on banks to play an enabling role in the smooth flow of money and the, the wider banking that d- democracy allows. So if we are looking at the problem of um, unbanked, uh, in, you know, in, uh, globally, right? Yeah. How do you see that issue to be solved? Well, this is where I think digital assets really come into their own as a force for democratic good and to provide an augmentation for democracy. Um, Here are a couple of examples. One is in Kenya where instead of using the Kenyan shilling, most people now, they buy and sell with airtime on their mobile phones. Now that's an incredible use of technology which is opening up banking, trade, communities within Kenya. But it's not just that, actually. I think it's also worth looking at some of those countries where there is high inflation, high interest rates, recession. I'm not talking, I'm not talking about the UK or the EU. Um, it, it probably, um, I think Nigeria is a, is a good example here. And there's been a lot of work done by Chainalysis on the use of digital assets as a means of banking in sub-Saharan Africa. And the uptake there has been very strong because digital assets can be used for not just a means of payments, but also a store of value against volatile and unstable national currencies. So I think that it's worth the UK banks considering this and considering what their part is, what their part should be to allow and enable banking within the UK for compliant non-criminal businesses and compliant non-criminal individuals. So if we have to send uh, a message to the government and banks, what would you say to them? I would say get in touch with me and I will arrange for, um, uh, for them to have a meeting with me and a number of my clients who can pinpoint exactly what the legislation says, exactly what the rules say, exactly what it is that my clients are doing and why it is non-criminal, why they apply anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing rules, how it is that blockchain actually makes all of this cleaner and then we start working out what we do. So I'm using there both the legislative approach and also the push of business and industry. So Claire, what else uh, the industry can do to solve this problem? Because from one side, yes, 
is uh, probably the banks and the government, they have to pay more attention, they have to and engage the, And more the regulators, with, yeah, I think the, the, the regulators and the FCA have to... Yeah, have to engage have to with the industry, that's fine, we clarify that point. But what else the industry can do? Because it's always like a two ways, uh, you know, dialogue and, and in proactive interaction as well. What the industry can do more to highlight this problem? What for instance, project they are working with you can do to push for a, for a change. Is there anything well, else? Can? I would say that, you know, I would say it is that push for dialogue. So I've been in touch with people um, behind the scenes in areas of policy to educate them. I have clients who are doing exactly the, exactly the same thing. And I'm not talking here about a, a one-sided lobbying. I'm talking about true education. Um, and, you know, we have to go to the banks, we have to go to the policy makers, we have to go to the regulators and explain to them. You know, I think we have to accept they're not going to come to us. So yeah. we, have, we, have, we have to go to them. And there are, you know, there are, there are, there are people and bodies out there that can, that can help. So if anybody watching this wants to take part, get in touch and I can put you in touch with people. And together we can have a voice which is loud but not shrill, that it talks sense, it talks education, and it shows, and it gives a proper demonstration of the clarity of transaction and parties to transaction that blockchain can bring. And hopefully banks will start adopting blockchain. I mean, how much more secure would all our transactions be? And hopefully would all our fin financial data be if it were on blockchain? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I just think there is always the risk of uh, hacking, but uh, I think there, there always is. Yeah, of course there is. But there's can risk of find way to, I mean, <laughs> technology can find ways to protect it, maybe it can, but you know what so. how much how much of our information is already held in a way that can be hacked oh yes so yeah. that's that's I was just, you know so, uh, you know maybe a closed blockchain exactly a private blockchain or some kind of like guards yeah. that can exactly it's an it's another protection i think i think I, I, I'd, I'd um i put my weight behind blockchain as an improvement on 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 current systems yeah well claire listen Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your insight. And, you know, I think we need a more project to engage with the, the regulators to tell loud, really, what the problems are. The, you know, and we what the answers are as well. Exactly, yeah. exactly. It, why it, what the problems are, what the problems aren't, and how together we can make it work. Claire, thank you so much. Oh, Steffi. Thank you for allowing me to, to talk my heart out about something that's a passion.